Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for showing up here in the room and for those that are online, thank you for choosing that choice as well. Um, my name is Cinnamon and I'm the organizer of Seminar. Um, and I just wanted to do a couple of quick announcements. We will continue, uh, at least for now, everything's changing every day. Um, with seminar series, but we'll continue with um, encouraging folks to listen online um, or when they come into the room to do social distancing, which we've done today. Um, so that means that next week on March 19th, we have um, Lori Whitecamp who's going to come and talk to us about the winter ecology of Pacific salmon on the high seas. Um, so I'm excited about that one. So either come join us here or listen to us online. Um, but today, um, we have Dan Bottom, who has been doing um, fisheries research for about 38 years, um, 22 of them with ODFW and Corvallis, and 16 of them here with NOAA um, at Hatfield. Um, and he has retired from federal service in 2016. And last night I said retired, and I'm probably going to do that again, um, because Dan, of course, is still very, very active in many of the things that he does. Um, he is courtesy faculty with Fisheries and Wildlife Department at OSU um, and is a member of the regional technical group um, at the Columbia River Estuary Ecosystem Restoration Program. Um, and so he's here to talk to us today a little bit about the work at Salmon River and some of the research, uh, research that has um, been applied at many of the estuaries. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to Dan. Thank you, Senator. So can everybody hear me okay? All right. Well, thanks for uh, those of you showing up and, uh, and those of you online. Thank you for uh, participating and thank you, Cinnamon, for setting this up. It's, it's, uh, it's really fun to be back here. I want to uh, up front acknowledge that what I'm going to talk about involves sort of a synthesis of a, of a couple of research projects that involve a whole lot of people, uh, and, uh, including my NOAA colleagues here and in Hammond and up in Seattle. And uh, Kim Jones, in particular, who was a co-PI with me when we started the Salmon River stuff, along with Cy Simonstadt from UW. So there was a whole crew from ODFW that uh, I've been involved with for years that uh, continued to work beyond my time there to set up another project on coho salmon I'm going to talk about and hopefully won't misrepresent. And uh, that's work that Kim Jones uh, started there in uh, 2008. And, uh, and then Cy has been involved both in the Salmon River work and the work uh, that we did with NOAA up in, uh, up in uh, the Columbia River estuary. All of, the, uh, all of the reconstructions on life histories that I'm going to talk about uh, with Otalus was uh, work that uh, Lance Campbell and Eric Volk both did with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, uh, Eric has gone on to work up in Alaska, but uh, we trained Lance and Lance took over. So. Well, with that as an introduction, um, I'll jump right in. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last decade, there's been a, a, a plethora of papers on the so-called portfolio effect that has been highlighting the effect of life history variation on stabilizing populations. And what's, what's been gratifying about it is that, that a lot of these have gone beyond just modeling to actual case studies where they're trying to either back calculate or compare populations to time or or at least provide evidence that this theoretical idea that, uh, that diversity might help stabilize populations might be real, and, uh, and also to find ways to measure it. Um, what you won't find is a lot of studies applying it uh, to life history diversity to, to uh, estuaries. Uh, estuaries have been kind of the forgotten life history of, of, of salmon all along, and it's been kind of slow to come along. and so. That's a little bit what I want to talk about uh, about today is the whole idea that diversity, that estuaries contribute to life history variation by providing an alternative place for salmon to rear when they're juveniles. And that in turn provides uh, some capacity to stabilize variability because uh, the portfolio effect, as it says, is that uh, since it spreads the risk in time and space throughout a river basin, and minimize the risk that anyone, that the entire population might get wiped out with any particular disturbance. So I'm going to talk just generally about habitat opportunity and life history variation, and then uh, jump into the Salmon River, which has been really a wonderful place to have had the, the, the privilege of working as long as we did. 
uh, it's, it's a very small, small system and it's kind of a model that helped us as we jumped into a much bigger system, the Columbia. Uh, we could do things at Salmon River we could never do in the Columbia. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about changing life histories and habitat opportunities, how they've changed in the Columbia River estuary, and then uh, what are some of the implications of the Salmon River results for uh, the Columbia uh, going forward. So my apologies to everybody for once again showing this slide uh, throughout my career. I think I've relied on this slide, but uh, what, it, what it is is just a, uh, shows the variation in life histories that Paul Reimers uh, detected way back in the 60s in Sixes River. And what was noteworthy about that was, first of all, there had not been a whole lot of work done on life history variation in Chinook salmon since the time that Willis Rich did it in the Columbia in the 19, uh, 1919. And uh, this was a very thorough uh, examination of life history variation uh, using the same technique that Willis Rich did when he got started, which was a scale pattern analysis. And there can be problems with that, but what was not a problem with Sai's work on this was, not Sai, uh, Paul Reimer's work on this, was that he was able to uh, verify those patterns that he was looking at because he sampled so frequently. And uh, he sampled at each stage of the life history throughout in the juvenile stage and was able to verify that those patterns existed. One of the patterns that he relied heavily on is, is so-called intermediate, gro intermediate growth, which was the notion that scale circuli would expand and get larger and the fish, when the fish were growing more rapidly as they did when they left freshwater and entered the estuary. And he was able to verify that in Sixes River. That wouldn't work everywhere. Uh, in Salmon River, for example, that pattern does not show up because the growth differential isn't great enough to, to reliably use, use it. Well, that idea of variability and the use of, uh, uh, of scale patterns to to understand those life history variations was put to the test uh, almost uh, immediately with uh, Mark Schlechter and Jim Likatowicz tried to apply it to the work that they were doing down in the Rogue River at the time as, as part of the, uh, the, the study of the, uh, of the dam that was going in at the, um, on the Rogue and they were studying the Spring Chinook population. They did go ahead and classify scales uh, uh, patterns on adult returns. So they looked at the juvenile scales just like Paul had done. Uh, one of the things that Paul had done was he had shown and documented that about 90% of the adults that came back to return in Sixes River were from a life history pattern that showed a long period of estuary rearing at the end of the summer season and they grew and survived the best. And so one of the things they were interested in was looking at whether that pattern showed up in the road. Uh, they did find that there was uh, a lot of patterns there, but they were not verified. So they were trying to apply basically the technique Paul used uh, without knowing for sure that the same technique would work, would work there. But what they did find that was interesting was 87% of the population, they could per reliably age them with this pattern. 87% uh, of the population migrated to the Sea of sub which is sort of contrary to what people generally think of spring Chinook. And they think of mostly of them being yearly migrants. And uh, as it turned out, the, the adults coming back were predominantly sub-yearling migrants. Uh, the other thing that was really interesting is that they did find evidence of an intermediate growth pattern, but was very rare in their samples. They don't know for sure whether it was estuary, but they assumed that it probably was. And they noticed by looking back at some old scales that they had back in 1945, that that pattern was much more prominent. And just almost as an aside, they hypothesized that maybe the loss of that pattern had something to do with the fact that the estuary, it's such a small one on the Rogue, uh, had, been, had been developed. And what little habitat that there was that fish could have reared in off channel was now a boat basin and, and confined by the jetties. So it no longer existed. And so this was the first example I found where there was an attempt to suggest that a life history pattern connected to a particular rearing environment and habitat may have been lost uh, and, and certainly highlighting the importance, whether or not they were correct, highlighting the importance of the connection between uh, habitat opportunity and life history expression. And the way the reason it becomes important when we talk about estuaries is that we've lost so much of them, uh, at least so much of the types of habitat that juveniles tend to rear in. And, uh, and 
what that is is particularly marsh channels and, and off-channel shallow water habitats that where they can get out of the main part of the current that are highly productive uh, uh, habitats. So one of the questions I've had all along is, is whether the loss of habitat that, uh, that has happened in all of our estuaries uh, over a long period of time, whether that has in fact diminished life history variation in our populations. And more importantly, now that there's a greater and greater interest in trying to put some of that habitat back, uh, what we know very little about is can you restore it? If, if you put that habitat back, will that re-expression occur? And will that diversity happen? That is, is, is life history diversity a, a, a resilient property of populations, if you will? So Salmon River, by any stretch, is, is a pretty small estuary. It's, it's uh, only uh, a little less than 2,000 acres in size overall. The basin itself is quite small. And the head of tide uh, only goes about four miles up the river, just above uh, Highway 101. There's a, hitch, a fish hatchery that was put in in the 70s, uh, located about a mile uh, further up. And uh, what makes this place special is that the whole area has been protected under the Cascade Head Scenic Research Area since, the, since 1974, which means there's been not only no development since then, but one of the purposes of that legislation was, was also to actually restore what had been lost to agricultural diking and, and, uh, and um, uh, tide gating. And all of that has, uh, much of that has been put back. So about 250 hectares or more than 600 acres were diked, almost all of it in the early 1960s, and leaving only about a quarter of what was there historically. And now about 70% of that has been uh, put back into the estuary through a whole series of, of, of uh, dike removal projects that started back in the late 70s. The first one was in 1978. You can see the, on there the, the night, what we call the 1978 marsh. That's why that's when the dike removal occurred. Nine years later, they took the one out there that's marked 87. And then nine years after that, the 1996 came out. Now, the fact that it was every nine years was just just fortuitous, but it was very lucky for us because it, it established sort of a natural laboratory to ask the question, okay, do salmon benefit the day that the dike comes out or does it take a long time for that marsh to develop and for them to benefit from it? And so that was the original approach that we were taking was to find out how long the recovery might be and what they would benefit from it. But it didn't take us long to get beyond that to start asking questions about the overall effect on the population including uh, on life history variation. I should point out that there's been a bunch of other restoration projects that have occurred more recently. Uh, some of them in the course of when Kim started his work on coho in 2008. But again, uh, the bulk of it happened, 60% of the restoration uh, happened, uh, or 60% of the wetlands were put back that had been diked uh, by the time we started our work in 1997 or 98 on Chinook salmon. So I'm going to talk about three things. One is, uh, is a pre-hatchery survey that, that was, was uh, started in 74 to 75. That's a work that was done on the basic life history of the Chinook and Coho salmon in Salmon River that Bob Mullen did. And we were just lucky enough to come around and, have, and benefit from the fact that that was done for totally different reasons but provided a nice baseline of what the population looked like. Just, just before the hatchery started operating, but while the entire wetland was diked. Uh, our work started in 1998, the real work. We did a pilot study in 97, but we got Sea Grant support. Oregon Sea Grant supported us for three fund successive funding cycles, something that's unheard of now. Uh, but starting in 98, we, we started our work uh, there for, for real. And that went till about 2005. And then another study with coho salmon that, that Kim started uh, began in 2008 um, associated with looking at the effects of closing a hatchery program that I'll talk about. So in both studies, we basically took a life cycle perspective. Um, there was a, a look at juvenile abundance and that there were actual population estimates done in the summertime that were at the end of the rearing period up in the uh, up in the head, headwaters or the upper parts of the basin uh, by ODFW. We did that with coho only, but with both Chinook and coho, we had a smoke trap down above the head of tide near the hatchery 
where we could mark fish and we could track fish moving from the upper basin to look at time and size at which they were leaving the basin. We had a whole series of sample sites in the estuary itself where we looked at habit, habitat use, movement, time and abundance, and growth. And then we, we followed the fish when they came back as adults. And we had spawning surveys uh, on, the, on the spawning grounds. And we could collect any fish that had been tagged, uh, as well as uh, uh, collecting otoliths to reconstruct juvenile life histories from the adult returns. Uh, I should say we also collected otoliths of the juveniles as they went out uh, at, near the mouth. So that gave us a way of re reconstructing when they had hit the estuary. So the juvenile uh, otoliths allowed us to say how long the fish had been in the estuary before they left, what size they entered the estuary, uh, based on the strontium signature that they picked up as they entered uh, the estuary from fresh water and hit tidewater. We also had pit tags during the coho study. We didn't have the advantage of that technology very, it was just getting going when we first started. Uh, we did some work within the marsh channels with it with Chinook, but we didn't do it in the, in the basin overall. Whereas with coho, we had a pit tag detector at the hatchery that we could uh, detect juveniles coming down and also detect adults going back up. And we had a pit detector uh, in one of the marshes to look at juveniles coming into the marsh. So very quickly, here is, is sort of a, a snapshot of the trend in catch per unit effort for three years in the 1970s. And if you just look at the dark line, you don't need to worry about anything else but the darkest line there uh, showing the curve. What that shows is the dashed line is July. And basically, uh, nothing was coming into the estuary back then until about July or August. And uh, that's pretty late compared to what we saw in other systems that we've studied juveniles uh, before. And we were somewhat surprised uh, to see that when we look back at that data. Because this is what it looked like when we did our sampling in 2000 to 2002. We saw fish coming in at a much smaller size. Uh, we saw a lot of fry migrating in. We saw uh, some small par um, migrating in or small sub earrings migrating in in the spring well before July a lot of them coming in in, in, in uh, April through June. And so this was, uh, to us, was sure evidence that fish were taking advantage of what had happened when we uh, converted that from a fully dike system to one that was uh, the majority of the wet ones were now accessible to those juveniles because most all of those fish we were catching in those wetland channels. This is a reconstruction of the proportions of different life histories. And I'll walk you through it real quickly for the juveniles that were leaving Salmon River. So in the, in the right here, um, E fry is emergent fry. Those are the ones that have just come out of the gravel and are moving through the system. Uh, ER is estuary residence time. So it was either less than 30 days or more than 30 days. And then we, we'd broken it up by size and time. So we have emergent fry less than 45. Spring migrants were March through May. Uh, summer migrants were June through August. And fall migrants were after September. These are all sub yearlings for Chinook. There are no spring Chinook and, or, or no yearling migrants in Salmon River. And so our sampling ended in the fall. But what it showed was that was very interesting. If you think back of that picture I just showed you about when they were coming in uh, historically, the, if you look at the black and the, and the green shades there, those are all early migrants. Those all came uh, in, in the spring, well before they were showing up uh, back in the 70s. So those are, are fish that wouldn't have been there had the dikes been uh, open, uh, the, or had, had, the, uh, had, had we left the dikes in. In the summertime, a good portion of these fish also would have not been there because uh, that includes some of, uh, a good portion of June. So uh, a lot of those fish simply weren't there. In fact, 17% entered before June, and nearly 70% reared in the estuary for more than 30 days, including some that had come down in June and stayed well longer. And uh, so those are fish that were all rearing for those extended periods in the wetland habitat that didn't used to be. Uh, available to them. This is a reconstruction of the adults. Same colored patterns uh, apply uh, 
To the right of the top here, you got the black, and to the right of that, the green. So again, that's those early migrants. Those are showing up on the adults. So those are surviving and contributing to the adults returning. And then a big portion, portion of those summer migrants uh, that uh, would have been starting in June uh, are contributing or are, are, are coming back. So all four of the life history types are contributing to adult returns, including the types, all of the types that were estuary resident types that were simply not there uh, when, the, when the system was fully diked. And now this is just by return year. Uh, we didn't have long enough to do a full reconstruction of the brood years because remember Chinook salmon go out and come back at multiple year classes from two up to six years old, something like that. And in, in Salmon River, uh, we had enough, uh, covered enough years to get the main part of the run in two of the years. So in 2001, we figured we had about 98% of reconstruction covered by the years we had based on the return ages that we see at Salmon River. We had about 69 for the 2000 brood and about 66% for the 2002 brood. So those are pretty good. The, uh, the, the 1990 brood was only about 47%, we estimate. But nonetheless, what it again shows is pretty much the same thing even when you look at it by brood year, is that all of those life history types are contributing to the adults coming back. 17 to 29% of the adult brood years were from those early fry migrants. And and uh, most of the spawners uh, had some kind of estuary resident life histories. So again, we're pretty heavily dependent upon staying in that estuary for extended time, and we know that those extended migrant or residents were using those wetland habitats. All right, this is just a map of the estuary. Uh, the dots are, are just where we sampled. We sampled basically for Coho, or Kim's group did for Coho, in the same places where we did Chinook. Uh, in the wetlands, some of them along the, along the channels, uh, along the estuary shores when you get down below the wetlands. And then there was a pit array up here at the 96 marsh, as I mentioned, uh, which captured any fish that came down and went back up into that channel. And then a pit array up there by the smoke trap, up by the hatchery, which we used to detect both out migrants and adults uh, leaving the watershed, or leaving or coming back to the watershed. Now, with coho, the conventional wisdom is, is that coho all go out as yearlings. Uh, they spend a full year in, in fresh water, uh, and then they migrate pretty rapidly downstream through the, through the estuary and onto the ocean. And so the estuary was always kind of an afterthought for, uh, for, for coho salmon. Uh, and that began to change about the time we started doing our work and started seeing, oh, huh, that's interesting. That hadn't happened before. So if you were to turn on your head, <laughs> you will see that uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the, left, the left panel is the yearlings. And what it shows is that in the spring, we have a bounce on the yearlings coming in in the spring. And that's the dominant part. It, it verifies basically what, what I said, is that in, back in the 70s, all the fish were going out as yearlings. And very few, if you look at the panel on the right, there's a few blips there, but very few, if any, sub yearlings coming down into the estuary when the estuary was fully diked. The following year, if you look at this one, or not following year, but in 2011, this panel uh, with a big blip here uh, near April is those, those yearlings again, just like we saw before. But the panel to the far right shows a whole lot of fish from the sub yearling side throughout the spring summer and fall showing up and being in Salmon River in the estuary. Same story as we saw with adults, uh, except that this one's on its side. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what we, what we were able to do was, uh, through, through Kim's work, was to classify coho life histories uh, in, in the manner here. So if you look at the white bars, that's basically time spent in stream and tidal fresh portion of the estuary, or yeah, the tidal fresh portion of the estuary, all the freshwater area from uh, age zero in the spring to age one the following summer uh, is what it shows on the right. So that far left side, the yearling migrants, that's the traditional conventional coho life history type. Uh, that we saw when everything was diked and we see in most, in most systems that people believe in. Uh, but we also found fish that were showing up in the estuary right after emergence and spending a whole year there. 
We then found some other fish that came down right after emergence and uh, stayed until the fall. And when the fall rains occurred, actually went back into freshwater, primarily in those small tributaries entering the lower part of the system down in the estuary itself. So they dispersed back up into fresh water. And it even shows very nicely on the otoliths. The, the uh, strontium spike goes back down and then goes back up when they come back and make their migration back through the, through the estuary on the way to the ocean. And then finally, we saw uh, some par migrants that would stay in fresh water until the first fall rains, drop down into the estuary, and uh, spend the rest of the time there. In this case, all of the fish, the opposite of Chinook, all of those went out as sub-yearlings. All of these went out as yearlings. We didn't see any evidence of coho leaving as sub-yearling migrants. They all went out as yearlings. But they did a lot of different things, including three life history types that were not uh, matching the conventional wisdom as to what coho are supposed to do. When we looked at the adult returns, this is for five different uh, return years here. If you look at that, you can see that on the right hand side the three estuary rearing types that showed up, the fry, the nomads, and the par. And collectively, even though any one type was not uh, huge, uh, they represented anywhere from 20 to 35 percent of the returning adults. So the conventional life history still was the most abundant, but it was not inconsequential that up to a third of the return in, in, in a particular year might be composed of these estuary migrants, again, that would not have been there if the estuary had been fully diked as it had been earlier. So in this case, again, estuary restoration has increased not only the diversity of the juveniles, but it's produced real adults. It's, it's increased adult production. So overall, we had six life history types that showed up uh, in response to uh, taking those dikes out uh, because we know that all of those were associated with wetland rearing off, off of the main channel predominantly. Uh, the emergent fry, spring, and part of the summer migrants uh, that we saw as life history types for the Chinook, and to the right, all the fry, and the nomad, and the par migrants for the coho. Well, come along around uh, 2005, ODFW began to be concerned about, uh, about the uh, listing of coho salmon that had, that had occurred again the year before and uh, did a viability analysis of the status of coho salmon up and down the coast. And uh, Salmon River distinguished itself in being the only stream in, on the whole coast that flunked all of the viability measures that there were. And the main reason that they concluded was the effects of the hatchery. Uh, the, the coho had been released from the beginning at the hatchery, just like Chinook. Both of, they released both 200,000 coho and 200,000 Chinook every year. And, and the reason was 200,000. That's because that's what the ponds would hold. And uh, in 2008, because of the, that uh, effect, the, the hatchery program was discontinued for coho altogether. A uh, Chinook continues to be released there at, at Salmon River uh, today. So one of the big concerns was, if you look at this graph, notice that between 1995 and 2007, up to 90% of the adults coming back were those gray bars. And those gray bars are just hatchery fish. And that means two things. One is we were getting no natural production out of that system uh, to speak of. For most of those years, the hatchery was operating. And even the hatchery fish weren't surviving because we, they clipped all the hatchery fish, right? So if we were getting survivors from those clipped fins, we'd see fish showing up that didn't have clipped fins, but we weren't. So except for possibly 2004, uh, the natural production was, was really low in that system. And that was one of the main reasons that they, were cons that, uh, they, they shut the hatchery program down. One of, the, one of the concerns about shutting it down, and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of cry about, about doing so from a number of quarters, was that if they stopped the hatchery program down, what was going to come back? Nothing was going to come back then, because there was hardly any wild fish in the system. Well, that proved to be uh, uh, a, mis, a misconcern, because uh, within a year, by 2009, uh, the production was, was back to all natural fish, 
And uh, the abundance was actually uh, slightly more, or at least equal, to what it had been before uh, without subsidizing with hatchery fish at all. Um, and, and so uh, it, it, it clearly it, it had been success, a successful recovery in that regard. Um, the other point is, is that there were few natural origin fish surviving at all when the, uh, back in the 90s, uh, even when those marshes were restored. So even though we were sampling back at that time for Chinook, and we were finding some subyearling coho dropping down into the estuary, you can see that they really weren't surviving. Uh, so one of, the, one of the big take homes about this is that uh, the hatchery program itself was preventing the uh, re-expression of that life history in the adult population, uh, even though the juveniles were showing up in the wetlands. They weren't surviving. Yes? Now, where were we seeing in 2016? Oh, these, these few hatchery fish? Uh, so we're getting some strain into that system out of basin. And uh, it might be Solette's, uh, which was the which was the brood that was originally used for the founding that prop. Uh, they started out with the Salmon River population originally, and then they had problems with the private hatchery showing up and straying into that system, and they got rid of the, of the, the uh, Salmon River hatchery brood, and, I, and they converted to the select stock. So there are two things that uh, they thought might explain uh, what was the problem with the hatchery with regard to Salmon River. One was the spawning timing was way out of whack. So if you look at the curve on the far right, that was what the old spawning timing was back in the 70s. Uh, if you look at the 50%, these are cumulative percent curves. So if you look at the 50% and carry that across, you can see that about, about half of the fish were spawning and uh, had spawned by mid-December and it continued on into February. By the time we started, uh, the coho program started with Kim's crew, you can see that all of the, almost all of the spawning was in November, and it was almost entirely done by, by Thanksgiving, which is way out of whack with all the other coastal basins. Uh, some kind of hatchery selection, we don't know exactly what drove it, but, but that was clearly it. And as soon as the program was ended, you can see it's begun to march back uh, toward, it still hasn't achieved where it was, but it has come back quite a bit. And the, the, the concern is is that we have all of our big storms in, in beginning around Thanksgiving through December. It can wash the eggs out of the gravel and the mortality is probably pretty high and we have no adults coming back to spawn after that. You could have very high mortality. The other uh, uh, possible influence on, on what, what happened is that when the hatchery was shut off in 2008, you see those black bars, the, the, the small to adult survival went up quite a bit. And uh, it's compared here to one of the life cycle monitoring stations that ODFW has nearby in the ALSI and uh, suggests that this is a, a, uh, a, a real cre increase in, in adult abundance. And again, uh, we don't think that, that, uh, that this has anything to do with any of the restoration that's happened more recently because most of the restoration in the estuary occurred much earlier, and we didn't get any response to that in terms of smolt to adult survival. So the, the hypothesis here is that possibly there was a competitive interaction going on at the same time with the juveniles. Because if you remember those, those life histories, virtually all of them are going out as yearlings. So all four of those life history types I described are there when they're releasing these hatchery fish in one big slug. So, so those 200,000 are interacting with all of the juveniles that are in the system uh, at the time of release. And so it could be that there were some competitive interactions with the juveniles also. So now I want to shift uh, focus and talk about the Columbia River estuary, which is another beast altogether. Uh, it's uh, about three orders of magnitude larger. Uh, head of tide isn't uh, four miles, it's uh, 200 and, or it's 146 miles. It goes all the way from the mouth up to the base of Bonneville Dam. And uh, there's a huge, long tidal fresh part of what we're calling the estuary uh, for the purposes of this. And uh, the salinity only extends uh, 
up here around Tongue Point, up into this part of the system right there. <clears throat> so Jen Burke uh, was a graduate student that worked with me and, and uh, worked on our project. And she was a, worked for Kim Jones, also for ODFW, while she was getting her master's degree. And she uh, took on the task of looking at Willis Rich's original uh, life history work in the Columbia. He sampled uh, 1914 to 1916, or 1916 to 1919, I think. No, 1914 to 16. And he uh, basically classified uh, uh, or did scale pattern analysis on those fish and tried to classify the patterns based on what he saw uh, from that work. I, I can't imagine what the job was like uh, back then trying to do this in, in, the, in the place the size of the Columbia uh, but in any case, he did it, and he, and he published the work in 1920, and Jen took this and tried to classify the life history patterns that he had described in great detail in his 1920 paper. On the left, this big blue line with those two humps is the fry migrants that first showed up in the estuary, and on the far right in the dash line, that's the yearlings that showed up in the estuary. So this is like uh, the proportions of these different life histories on an 18 month for a particular for a single brood. So they, she basically has collapsed all of those three years of data into a single brood to, to look at what the relative proportions of these types are to try to derive some idea of the variation. In between those two extremes are a whole bunch of sub yearling life history types. And I just draw your attention to uh, the, uh, the, the purple one here, which is the two hump purple one there, which is fish that are coming down as fingerlings, spending an extended period of time rearing in the estuary before they go out. Jen then compared that, those patterns that she saw from and interpreted from Rich's uh, descriptions to what the data she had then. And at that time, that was before NOAA began a, a whole new series of estuarine studies. But there were, had been a lot of beach sanding that had gone on in the Columbia for a long time uh, in the same area where um, well, Willis Rich did his work. So she used that data. And she inferred that all of that variation had been more or less collapsed into this single hump, uh, in which represented primarily fish coming down as larger fingerlings that didn't stay very long in the estuary and moved on through, including a lot of hatchery fish. And this is basically a hypothesis that, uh, that you know, we can't prove one way or the other. We don't have Willis here to to, uh, or the original scales to go back or otoliths to, to verify. But it seems to fit pretty much what we saw when we started working in the lower estuary again in 2002. And if you look at this, all of those colored uh, lines are different catch per unit effort curves that we saw in the estuary showing the timing. And it, they do seem to co coincide. That peak is fairly narrow, and it does coincide with that main period in the, in the spring and in the summer. And 1916 line there, the dash line, is what Willis Rich found, which is a much more protracted migration through the estuary, particularly a, a longer period in the, in the fall of, of estuary use. Now, lots of things obviously can cause that. Um, and, and I'm not going to try to attribute it to any one thing. And certainly a, a big part of that, no small part of that, might be the loss of the upriver populations when the dams went in that may have been some of the later migrants that came down. But it also could be warm temperatures. Uh, the fish are leaving the wetlands we see today when the temperatures get up around 19, 20 degrees, which, what's hap which happens by July uh, or even, even earlier. And another one could be uh, loss, loss of habitat within the estuary itself. Uh, this is a, uh, a reconstruction of habitat patches. Uh, I work with a group called the Expert Regional Technical Group for the, on the Columbia. Uh, Kim Jones is on that group as well, and a, and a group of uh, several other folks. And uh, we've relied on some GIS work from Phil Trask and Associates that have reconstructed what the historical habitat patches were and what they are today. And basically what it shows is that we've lost a lot of habitat. Uh, and in fact, at, as a total, about 70%, very similar to Salmon River, of the historical habitat is no longer longer there. Uh, this graph is, is just showing, again, an, an indicator of fragmentation. Uh, this is a plot of habitat patches that are greater than five acres in size 
and we just chose that arbitrarily as a size that was perhaps big enough to have some uh, fish, hold some fish, and uh, support them to reside there so it would have some kind of a channel running through it that they could get into. Uh, the, the yellow ones are the, are the distances between habitat patches historically. The green ones are what it is today. And it just basically shows that there's been quite an increase in distance between habitat patches uh, and, and indicator of fragmentation compared to what it was historically. Well, as a result of all this, uh, some, some big changes have occurred in the, in the Columbia uh, since about 2004. There's been a major restoration effort to try to put, ha uh, to restore habitat in the estuary. Uh, and it began with the biological, one, one of the many biological opinions that uh, uh, decided that estuary mitigation could be a good way to try to take care of, uh, to help mitigate for some of the ongoing mortality that was occurring at the Columbia River dams. And so this was an effort to try to improve survival of those juvenile fish that were still going to be suffering some mortality going over the dams. Uh, since 2004, there's been 58 projects, and this represented a 12% increase in the overall amount of wetland area that was there when it got started. That's the good news. The bad news is it's still only about two-thirds of what was there historically. So there's, there's plenty yet to be done. Uh, the upper graph just shows the timing of when those projects went in. So since uh, 2012, there was a real uptick in the, in the, in the amount of, uh, of the number of projects. And the lower graph on the lower right-hand side is just where the projects are located. Well, in addition to that mitigation effort, which is a fairly recent one, there's been another mitigation effort that's been going on upriver since, uh, since the 40s, or even before. But, but since about 1946, there have been 20 hatchery programs dedicated by law for trying to mitigate the effects of the loss of habitat up in the upper part of the basin where fish can no longer get to, to spawn. And so those so-called mitigation hatcheries are releasing about 63 million uh, Chinooks are, are salmon total into the basin. Uh, and there are some 82 hatcheries overall. That's about 20, about 20 hatcheries uh, are those Mitchell Act programs. There's about 140 million fish being released from 82 hatcheries, hatcheries total in the basin. So the Mitchell Act is a big proportion of the total what's coming out of there. So those are those bigger production hatcheries. There's been a big effort in recent years to try to improve hatchery practices due to concern about the effects that they have on the viability of natural populations. But most of those efforts have been focused so far on interactions that are occurring at spawning up in the natal streams, either due to, to avoid interbreeding uh, between natural and wild populations and to avoid competition in their natal streams. Uh, they don't address things going on further downstream once they all uh, intermingle in the estuary. One of the interesting things in the EIS for, the, for the, some of those hatchery uh, reforms, the EIS that was written, uh, one of the quotes is that the least risk from competition are those hatchery programs that produce full-term, rapidly migrating smolts that use river corridors as a highway to the ocean. And that's been the conceptual framework all along with hatcheries, is that they just bomb on through, and if you raise them big enough and release them uh, large enough, they're, not, they're just going to be going to be gone, and so we don't have a competition problem. Uh, this is, this is the, uh, what we have here uh, for, I just wanted to show these years because 2010 and 11 is the data I'm going to show, and it wasn't until 2007 we even marked enough hatchery fish to be able to distinguish a hatchery from a wild fish when we sampled them in the estuary. Of all the hatchery fish, that 140 million that I told you about, about 100 million of them, or three quarters of them, are Chinook salmon uh, that get released in the Columbia. And about two thirds of those are released as sub yearlings, and the other third as yearlings. Almost all of the yearlings are now marked, and about 87% of the sub yearlings are now marked. So in 2010, we undertook a study that wasn't a, about hatcheries and, uh, at all, it was about trying to understand the distribution of different genetic stocks moving through the estuary. And so we did, it was a, a fairly infrequent sampling in order to cover spatially a big area. So we only sampled every other month about, uh, but we had uh, three different habitats that we sampled in eight different estuary reaches. 
And so these are the eight reaches A through H that I, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, but that's what those other graphs were showing with the habitat was those three, those uh, eight different reaches. There are different hydrogeomorphic reaches uh, that Cy Simonstead class, uh, classified on the basis of, of different processes that drive them and the different geomorphology of those sites. They provide a useful way to distinguish uh, what are somewhat uh, certainly different tidal influences uh, from the mouth where it's a tidally driven estuary to up here at H where it's pre pretty much a river dominated at, uh, tidal fresh estuary. Anyway, we had three different habitat types within each of those reaches. Uh, I'm going to talk about two of them, the backwater which, uh, and, the, and the main stem ones. The backwater ones were usually off the main channel behind an island uh, and the main stem are right, right along, as you would guess, along the main navigation channel. Well, this is a comparison of the size classes of the marked and the unmarked fish. And what you can see is that the marked fish are very, very much a normal curve, but tightly strung around 80 millimeters fork length. And then there's a second uh, hump there up around 120. That's the yearling releases. Uh, we don't catch as many yearlings inshore. These are all beach scene samples that we did. So this is in shallow water near shore habitats near uh, those wetland habitats for some of the uh, juveniles, uh, if they're not where they where they rear and where they come out of when the when the tide goes goes out. On the bottom is the unmarked fish that we cap captured in those sites, and as you can see, it's much more of a skewed distribution, a much broader distribution uh, of fish. Uh, the hatcheries are clearly selecting for a large size at age. This is what it looks like. Again, I, I wish we had more than a bi-monthly comparison, but I find it pretty fascinating to look at the, that May and July period. Okay, remember that's when the bulk of the fish are going through. It's when the bulk of the hatchery fish are released. And look, they don't change in size one iota from May to July. They're very uniform. They're all released at that size and that distribution doesn't change. Look at the unmarked fish, what they're doing. Uh, some of those could be, uh, you know, uh, size-dependent mortality. Smaller fish could be uh, affecting that. We have some smaller fish coming down from upriver that could affect it. Lots of things could affect it, but a big, I think the biggest part of what you're seeing there are fish that are residing in the estuary and growing while they're there. So this I'll have to walk you through. It's a little bit complicated, but what I wanted to, what I was trying to ask the question was whether uh, what percent of the fish that we were sampling near shore in our beach seine were marked fish by number and what percent were hatchery fished by biomass. And so we converted our numbers to biomass through length frequencies and, uh, and the weighing that we had done on, on, on subsamples. It was a very tight fit. I, I feel real confident about that. I feel less confident about trying to say a per unit area from a beach seine, but it's pretty useful because when you do it within a reach and compare things, it, it, you're just comparing apples to apples, so it works out fine. So the M and B across the x-axis on those are the main stem and the, and the uh, backwater habitats. And then the, the reaches are A through H, again, going from the mouth up to the upper part of the estuary. So if you look at the dark ones first, the dark symbols are just the, the percent of the fish that were marked that we caught uh, just by number that we caught in each of those sites. And so what it shows is that basically less than half of the fish, there was a higher proportion of unmarked fish near shore in those shallow water habitats, as you would expect for smaller fish to be the predominant fish that you would see near shore. But the other side of that coin is we consistently saw a lot of marked fish in near shore in those habitats. So there were a lot of hatchery fish 20 to 40 percent of them consistently through, if you look at the bottom graph, through all of these months uh, that we sampled, there were hatchery fish present. So they weren't just bombing through, it wasn't just a highway. And even if it was, they were releasing enough fish from 80 hatcheries that if some of them left, even if the individual residence times weren't long, uh, some other fish were there to replace them when they left because we were catching hatchery fish in these shallow water habitats throughout, throughout the year. If you look at it by biomass, it gets even more scary. Uh, you, you look at the gray uh, biomass lines to the right that are little lighter shades. You can see that 50% or more in, these habit, in a lot of these habitats 
were, were, uh, were marked fish. So what we have is a continued interaction or potential for interaction in these shallow water habitats between hatchery fish that are less numerous but much larger and could have a big, uh, could have a dominant effect uh, in any interactions that are occurring. So I can't draw any conclusions from that other than to say that the estuary is not a highway. They do show up in the same habitats at, uh, all the time. Uh, it's possible that there was a real fine spatial segregation between them near shore. I don't think so, uh, based on what we've done. And again, when those tide channels drain from these wetlands, which we weren't sampling here, they end up near shore where we were sampling. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure that we were seeing uh, the potential for some interaction. So overall, the salmon river results, I think, uh, by themselves validate the relationship between estuarine habitat opportunity and life history expression. When the habitat wasn't there, the life histories were much simpler. When the habitat was put back, they got much more complex. It also showed that estuarine habitat is something that can, or uh, life histories, estuarine life histories is something that can recover uh, if habitat opportunities are restored. And that's not too surprising when you consider how plastic, at least Chinook life histories have been shown to be in literature. And it appears that coho may be the same way. Uh, all of those life histories contributed to adult production, so not just the diversity uh, as, as uh, something to help the portfolio effect, but also real abundance. And few of the naturally produced juvenile coho, uh, however, survived until the hatchery was shut down. So there was an interaction between those two things that prevented that re-expression of that life history in the adult population in the survivors uh, when the hatchery was operating. And that's, that's a real cautionary tale when we start thinking of a place like the Columbia where we're trying to do both of those things at the same time. Uh, in the Columbia River, losses of naturally produced juveniles had been replaced. Uh, and I'm, by that, I mean we've lost those populations that we've lost in the upper basin. We replaced them with these mitigation hatcheries, right? Mostly lower Columbia River stocks by design. And, and they're all pretty uniform. So we replaced what was a fairly diverse portfolio of fish with a very uniform hatchery product uh, that are all released during a fairly short time in the peak of the migration between May and July. And so we've reduced the life history variation. I think that has a lot to do with that hump that, that we're seeing. And it hasn't replaced what we lost upriver with the, with the others. Um, the effort primarily to reform hatcheries by segregating them uh, in their natal streams and on the spawning grounds from the wild fish, uh, whether or not that's working, it's not working downstream in the estuary. Uh, they're all integrated down there based on what we show. They're, at least they're, the potential for integration is there near shore. We don't know what the effect is, but it raises at least some concern. So all I'm able to raise here is that I think there's the possibility that this persistent large biomass of hatchery fish near shore raises the possibility of, of competitive interactions with smaller nationally produced salmon that could uh, undermine the potential benefits that we are presuming we're getting from restoring uh, wetland habitats. So with that, I'll ask, answer any questions if I can. <laughs> I guess I've been looking at yearling data for too long now and not the, the sub yearling because to me I would have expected there to be a larger percentage of marked sub yearlings. Um, in, 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 in short? Yeah. Oh no. So I mean the conventional wisdom is and, and I think we may have been part of the problem propagating this notion because when we started our work in these shallow water habitats we were focused entirely on sub yearlings because most of the sampling that had been done had been done along the main channel not too unlike where these beach sand sites were but they were predominantly collecting yearlings and when we went into shallow water habitats and up into intertidal channels further and further up we got predominantly smaller and smaller fish, fry, and fish that weren't, we weren't seeing as many elsewhere, which is what we had expected would occur, because they're trying to get out of the main current, right? 
But what this is showing is the other side of that coin, is that yes, they are most abundant, those smaller fish near shore, but uh, in shallower habitats off the main channel. But they're not exclusively small fish. We're getting larger fish too uh, concentrating in shore, and a lot of those are marked fish. Those, a lot of those are hatchery fish, and they're much larger. Yeah, but I would have expected even more hatchery fish. Why is that? I don't know, because there's just you know so many, at least with the yearlings, we see so many unmarked, so many marked, so few unmarked fish. Yeah. Uh, in what in what in what in what areas? In, in which in which places that you're sampling? Oh, in you know in Lori's sampling in the main stem. Yeah. So in the main stem, that that doesn't surprise me so much, and particularly when you get get you know up in you know for example, if you're talking about not beach sand samples, yeah. but her other samples. That's what we would expect. And that's where a lot, of the, a lot of the early work that was done was done on tagged fish to look at resonance and move. And of course, they had to tag real big fish. And those are bombing through. And so then that sort of added to the notion that the estuary was just a corridor that they were migrating through rapidly. Because a lot of the early work was focusing on tagged fish to watch the migrations of fish from Bonneville on down and to estimate migration rates. Well, they could only use big fish because that's all that could accept a tag. And it was only when we started looking at small fish that we began to be able to document long residence times. And it's the smaller fish that want to stick around longer, and they hug the shore. Lori's work with Curtis, they did that paper in 2008, uh, not 2008, um, I, I forget, 2000, it was more recent than that, 12, 14. They did a paper comparing purse sand catches and beach sand catches down near the mouth. And th they also looked at biomass. And, and what it showed was that the biomass was really concentrated in shore. And so it would fit particularly down near the mouth, perhaps more what you're saying down there too, is that they're staging to leave. You might even get more interaction of some of those marked fish in with the unmarked fish. Yes, Senator. There's a question online um, about fishing pressure on the Salmon River. Was it restricted after the coho hatchery program was terminated, or was it unchanged between the two? So most of the fishery in Salmon River has focused predominantly on Chinook. And so, uh, and there's been no change uh, that I know of uh, on, on the hatchery, uh, unless Kim has, uh, wants to, has a question, or uh, wants to chime in and has something more to clarify on that. I'm not seeing anything coming in. Oh, Kim, Keep going, I'll take a second. To okay, try. that's fine. <laughs> so, yes. So, I have this lingering question on kind of the site scale. Yeah. Uh, so, when these fish are using estuaries, are they leaving with every tide? The majority would, but but can they can they stay and do they find pools and is that a safe? I'm not sure I'm following your question. So, so they again. come into the estuary, mm -hmm. they come into the tide channels that you've been and you go out and about, can they stay in those tide channels? Can they stay in pools? Or is that, is that unsafe? Yes. Yeah, so so it, w w w one of the ways we sampled uh, is we set up these trap nets in these tide channels. And we put them up at high tide. And we sometimes, because they didn't fully drain, we'd have, to, we'd have to herd them down. And there are times when it looked like some of those fish would, would stay in, in, in pools. But if they do, they probably go down to the mouth where that pool is is pretty connected. I don't think they get. I, I think they have a behavioral knack in not getting stranded if they can, you know, unless there's a barrier that's been constructed or something. They'll move down. So we saw evidence from tagging and marking in like that that reference channel in Salmon River where they would come on down. Uh, the same pool of fish would come down. They'd be mostly flushed out by the tide and leave, and then they would go back in. And we had evidence based on the size classes of those fish and some of the marks that we recaptured that they tend to go back into the same areas. The, the fish that came out less last were the ones that were furthest up the drainage, and they'd go back up a little further than the, than the ones that were down low that went further into the main stem when the tide went out, if, if you understand. So their placement in the, they kind of sloshed with the tide as far as how far downstream they went of the channel and then went back in. But we saw, 
fish, we had tagging experiments of fish that they, they had a fidelity to channels, particularly larger networks. So they might not use the real small tag channels repeatedly, but if you had a, had a big major channel that had lots of small fingers coming off, off through a wetland, uh, you might see the same fish for a period of weeks in that larger complex. Although if you sampled one of those smaller tributaries repeatedly, you might only see it there every five days or something. So, so they have a fidelity to a large network, but it has to be big enough, I think, for them to stick around that long, uh, as opposed to a real simple little channel that uh, can't hold that many fish. Yeah. So as a corollary then, I mean, it's a part by Greg Hood, right? It's big on beavers and, and these tidal freshwater systems. So they love to dam these things up. Right. And so now in those systems, how do the fish get in and out? Is it only on an overtop of tide? Or oh, I, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And the coho love it. Uh, that's really good coho habitat. So are they staying? Yeah. They yeah, yeah, they'll stay behind that, and particularly like those nomads. Uh, we saw that in Salmon River. They'll go up in those little day streams, and there was a, there were, and a couple of those would have these beaver dams down below, and they'd find their way into those almost immediately. And uh, they really take advantage. They love that organic, rich, uh, all those beaver dams. That's what protects it. them makes that a safe place? What protects them? Well, so, they, so the tide goes out. you got a beaver dam, and they stay up there because it's a cool spot. What about that area? Well, most of the beaver dams that, that we see, uh, you know, ty uh, are in, are are still fresh water. They're not they're not saline situations, so they're holding back fresh water. And uh, a lot of the ones that we've actually sampled, uh, Greg may have some other information, but a lot of the ones that we've sampled have still been pretty connected with the stream above, so they're not isolated pools. Yes, Kim, Kim did respond and say, no, in river fishing on Cobo before or after the, the Yeah, because it had already been shut down. Right. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else online? All right. All right. You are off the hook. Thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, sticking through the uh, bearing with us on the, the epidemic and everything. <laughs> That's right.